The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 15th chapter. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Before, but she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Context matters. Today's text, I think, presents some potential challenges in how we see Jesus. And at first, it might seem pretty contradictory to, to who we understand Jesus to be and to some of the things Jesus has taught us before. And of course, context matters in the all of Scripture, but I think it's particularly helpful when we have a confusing text as today. And so here's, here's why. Here's a little bit of an example why I think context matters. One scenario. In today's gospel, Jesus is tired. They're just coming along from the other stories that we've talked about over the last few weeks. He's tired. They've been traveling. He decides he's going to ignore this woman. He's just not going to listen. And the disciples are grumbling, and this woman is a foreigner, and she's a woman. Um, they're not supposed to talk to her anyways, and maybe they're a little embarrassed because she keeps calling after them. Maybe they want the awkwardness of her following them to just go away. So they say, Jesus, make her go away. And so Jesus responds as they would expect. Now, why would they expect this? If you'll remember, Matthew's gospel is written to the Jews, the people who were living, and it, particularly um, at that time, they were living in this place where they weren't Jewish anymore because they were following Jesus, but they weren't Christian because that wasn't really a thing yet. They were kind of in this in-between place. So they would know the ways of the old world, but they would also be living into this new thing. And so they would hear what he said as an appropriate thing to say. And maybe there were others around waiting to catch him in an act that was illegal against the law. Maybe uh, there was leaders that were already starting to get a little frustrated with Jesus' teaching. He was doing all these things, and tensions were building. So maybe they were around to catch him. So he, he responds appropriately. But this woman is persistent. Jesus ignores her. She keeps on asking. Jesus says no, because this is for the Israelites. She gets on her knees and asks again. And to this, Jesus now calls her a dog. She doesn't even blink an eye. This woman doesn't even disagree. Perhaps she sees herself as unworthy. But her faith in Jesus is still so strong that she recognizes that even a crumb of nourishment that Jesus provides is enough to heal her daughter. So, given this, Jesus finally recognizes her faith and affirms that it is enough to heal the daughter. This makes me wonder, was it pity that he finally did the healing? Does he just realize she's not going to give up, so he might as well do it just to keep her quiet? Is it that he really doesn't believe her faith at first and then changes his mind? Or does he just decide maybe he doesn't want to look like a hypocrite himself for what he's been teaching? 
To me, none of these reasons make sense, but they feel like the only ones that you can use to make this initial part of the scene make sense. And the part about Jesus saying that he only came for the lost sheep of Israel seems to really contradict just about everything else he has said in the Gospels at this point in his ministry. So maybe there's another possibility. Maybe there's another way to see this story. Because there's an optional set of verses in this particular reading that we're given the, the option to read on Sunday morning or not. And I think they help us make a little bit more sense of what Jesus is doing. So we're going to go back and we're going to read the first 10 verses, also from Matthew 15. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached him and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that, is my, that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. So, Jesus has just finished talking about what makes a person unclean. And he's telling them that while the law says not washing your hands before you eat makes what you put in unclean, and it's not what you put into your body that makes you unclean. And specifically, again, remember, Matthew is talking to these Jewish people who would be concerned about these laws. And in this in-between time, does the law still apply? Does it not apply? How you eat, whether your hands are washed, does this still matter? Jesus says, what makes you unclean does not come from dirty hands or what you put into your mouth, but what comes from your heart. So now let's go back to the scenario. The woman is calling to Jesus. The disciples are grumpy, but Jesus has been teaching them and they still don't understand. So Jesus still says what people would expect what would have been seen by those he called blind in the previous story. But perhaps he also knows that he plans to heal this girl. He sees that this woman is persistent. She's a persistent mom wanting her daughter to be well. So he pushes the story just a little further to show that even as they all see her unworthy, and maybe even she herself sees herself as unworthy, that he has come to love and save what others would claim as unworthy. In this case, what Jesus does initially isn't so contradictory to what we've heard throughout all of gospel. It works with it to help him prove a point. Occasionally, when I share this viewpoint, people question whether I'm just making excuses because I don't like the way Jesus is portrayed or it makes Jesus sound bad. Or maybe I'm just uncomfortable with it with these hard things that Jesus says sometimes. But for me, this is where context matters. It's not because this second scenario makes it easier for me to love Jesus. It's because, in fact, I choose to look at the whole picture of Scripture. This passage doesn't exist alone, but it's part of the whole of Scripture from the beginning to the end. So let's go back to our reading from Isaiah today, after the exile. Isaiah is written in two parts, before the exile and then after. And so chapter 56 is after the exile. God is bringing back together the remnant of Israel that had been exiled. He's bringing them back together. He's fulfilling his promises. And this is what he says. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these will I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. 
Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. So even the prophets before Jesus are telling this message from God, because prophets are messengers from God. They're not just future predictors or fortune tellers. They they tell the messages from God. They're telling how God will come for the chosen, yes, but also for the foreigner with faith. Just as Jeremiah describes in a new covenant. But it's not just for the chosen. This is where what Jesus initially says kind of contradicts, but that's why scenario two makes more sense. So then we move forward and we look at our Romans writing this weekend. Paul writes that God has not rejected his people, these same people from the Old Testament, meaning these Jews that he's speaking and writing to. He's, they're confused in Rome. Are we this? Are we that? Are we supposed to follow the laws? Are we even still the chosen ones? Paul says, of course. But then he also reminds them that God kept a remnant. In the story we heard last week about Elijah and the people who followed Baal and what happened and Elijah made the sacrifice and the Lord came and set it on fire. And there were 7,000 who did not bow to Baal. And so this is the remnant. And then Paul writes, so too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So this new group of people is not just chosen by the law, but they're chosen by God's grace, just as the new covenant in Jeremiah shares. This isn't the 7,000 from the very beginning of the story with Elijah. This is a new remnant. Those who have faith not by their works or the law, but by faith that they have received. These Jews are now living into this new covenant, a new remnant fulfilled not in the law, but by God's grace in Jesus Christ. This remnant is all who saw Jesus' works, death, and resurrection, and have come to follow Christ and those Gentiles for whom Christ's love and grace and mercy has saved as well. This is the new remnant that Paul writes to And finally, Paul says even more that God's love is irrevocable. Once it's given, it's never taken away. So we have the Old Testament with the New Testament and the gospel today, all sharing a bigger picture. And then today, we are a people of faith. We're not only a remnant, but people that God has brought together, remnants from all places and all walks of life. Some of us were born into our faith. We've known about Christ our whole life, and some people have come to find faith later on. And there are still more whom God has saved who are now just coming or will come to understand the extent of God's love. If we take the gospel passage today without context, we completely misunderstand what Jesus is doing because context matters and the whole story matters. Christ recognizes faith even in those most people wouldn't expect or deem worthy. So scripture may be complicated, but what isn't complicated is the extent and magnitude of God's love and mercy for all. Amen.